Okay, here's a really key thing to note. SQL Server databases have at least two files. You're going to have transaction log and data file. Now, you might have two data files and one log, eight data files and 17 logs. I don't know yet. Can't really answer that yet. We're going to come to talking about multiple file databases later on. But these are actually two physical files. We'll see that here in just a second. They're files at the hard disk level. They're stored on the hard drive here. So there's one data file, one transaction file, and you may have multiples of each. Now we also see that you can commonly call the transaction log just the log file. So if you hear me later on in the course just say log file, that's what I'm talking about. Now the data file, let's just talk about what's, each, uh, what's in each of these files. So let's talk about the data file. Data files have everything that you need to work with if you're a user. So all the data is in there. The stored procedures, the triggers, the indexes, the routines, the methods, the functions, the views, all of that, it's all stored in the actual data file. So you could actually think of, well, that, uh, with, okay, like this, okay, think of it this way. Data file, take a look at the transaction log here on the next screen. The transaction logs are used to protect your database from failure. And we talk about the different types of failure. A database is the granular level that you need to work with. So that means, what I mean by that, I know that's a little bit of a confusing statement, but I mean that a database can be copied from one server to another without losing any information. You want to move from server X to server Y, then you could cut and paste the files the transaction log and the data file. They have everything that database needs to operate. Yes, there are going to be a few security things that you have to worry about, but the data is there, the indexes, the methods, the stored procedures, the user accounts, all of that is stored in that database. Okay, so everything that a database needs is stored in the actual files. Now, the types of failures that the transaction log can help us with would be user errors. Somebody running a statement that they wanted to undo. Uh, they could have, help us with disk failure. I'll, I'll speak more to the disk software and blue screen of death failures in just a minute. Let me kind of get through a few other key concepts before we can make sense of that. Now, every write, W-R-I-T-E, that's done in a database uses the transaction log, and it's done inside of what we call a transaction. So any modification you do in a database, whether you know it or not, is done inside of a transaction. Now we deal with what's called write ahead logging in SQL Server. And it means that the transaction is written first to the transaction log, and then later it's added to the data file. Okay, so write ahead logging, this is the way all systems work today. Uh, anything from Access, Microsoft Access to Oracle to DB2, everybody uses write ahead logging today. It's a pretty simple concept. Let me just draw out a couple of things here. Uh, so let's say that we have this statement. I want to do an insert, and I want to insert 100 rows. So here's actually how it works. Let's just draw a line here. Here's the transaction log, and it actually writes 100 rows to the transaction log. And then once those rows or a row is written to the data file, or once it's written rather to the log, then it's written to the data file. Right ahead logging. So it logs the transaction, and then it writes it to the data file. And what this allows for is that what would happen if we started a transaction and we wrote that transaction successfully in the transaction log, so we actually were okay writing it up here, but then we have a failure right here. So right as we were writing it to the transaction log, we had a blue screen of, to the data file, we had a blue screen of death, or uh, the system crashed for whatever reason, and we were unable to write it to the data file. Well, as we're going to learn in an upcoming slide, that transaction will be durable. 
and the transaction log can help us recreate that transaction when we restart our SQL Server service. So just think about that in terms of what is right ahead logging and how does the transaction log work. So when you're working with transactions at the SQL level, you start with the begin trans statement. And it's very common to have multiple statements. Your transaction also remains open until you either commit or roll back. You can only do one of those things, right? You can't commit and then roll back because once you commit or roll back, the transaction is closed. And once closed, that transaction can never be reopened. Never. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. No exceptions to that. And I just have a little bit of sample code showing you the begin tran and the commit tran. If you're kind of familiar with SQL, you can make sense of this. If you're not all that familiar with SQL, the two declares up at the top are declaring variables. And then we're populating the pay amount variable to be $1.94. So we're paying in the payroll processing history table. We're inserting a row. And then we're assigning an ID. This uh, is probably, if, if something confuses you, it's probably this right here. Uh, right there, the scope identity. This here is assigning the processing history ID variable equal to the ID that got created in the payroll processing history. And then we use that later on and we insert into the checks to write table. We need to say, I need to write a check for that processing history ID in this amount. And you can see that we commit that transaction at the very end. So once we've committed it, we cannot roll it back. Now, in the real world, you would have more logic than this. You would have error checking. You might have a try catch. There'd be a lot more to it. But it does, I think, serve as a basic understanding of what commit does. It closes that transaction for us. Now, in as I mentioned, the transactions in SQL Server are durable. Once that transaction is committed, that transaction is going to remain in the database even if the system crashes. And I go back to that discussion here. I'll just do this demo. I, I kind of did it already uh, to a certain degree. Where is my, oops, sorry about that. Um, where is my... There, sorry, it's hard to find. I need to increase the size of that. Uh, so we were inserting 100 rows, right? Let me just write this out. 100 rows, and we'll just say do this line. And so we write into the transaction log, and then into the data file, just as we did in the the previous example. So really, to write 100 rows, you write 100 rows to the transaction log and then it also writes those same 100 rows into the data file and when we say durable what will happen is you commit these they get committed and it writes them to the data file here and if at some point, if somehow this gets committed in the log, but it doesn't get written to the data file, so we had a system failure that prevented it writing, the durability property of a SQL Server or a relational database says, I guarantee you, when you start the SQL Server up, it will go through the process of rolling forward transactions. Okay, so rolling forward, the transaction means that it looks in the log when it starts up, and it says, are there any transactions that have been committed in the log, but that have not been written to the data file? Oh, there are? Well, then I'll roll those forward. And so on startup, it will then complete that action and write those 100 rows to the data file. That's called rolling forward. Now, the other side of this is if there are uncommitted transactions in the log, those will be rolled back. Now you should know that. So if we did have a crash like this, it will roll forward committed transactions that are found in the log but are not yet in the data file. But it will roll back uncommitted transactions. 
you can only persist committed transactions in the database. Now, lest I lead you astray, this is a concept level drawing here. This is not exactly how life works. I made it seem as though this were a synchronous or serial operation, meaning that the 100 rows had to be written to the transaction log, then committed, and then they would be written to the data file. 